I want to, I hope you don't mind. Uh, what are you going to say if you do mind, right? Like, yeah, I do mind. Well, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I want to do a, a building update. Uh, I want to start by just uh, thanking everybody who has given financially to the uh, building renovation and also those of you who have given up your time to go out and help. It has been greatly appreciated. Uh, we do covet your prayers as we move forward. We're by faith just trusting God to provide all the finances we need. We're not getting a loan uh, from the lender and as such we are just uh, moving forward really one day at a time by faith and God has really uh, as he's always so faithful to, just been so amazing in putting, on, putting it on uh, the hearts of God's people to give. And so we've been able to get a lot done. I want to show you some of the things that we've accomplished and some of the progress we've made uh, with some of these uh, pictures. We'll just take a few moments. I don't want to do this on Sunday because it's Communion Sunday. So, oh, before I forget, guys, uh, the God-centered, God-led rally is coming up on... Uh, that's this Saturday. That's this Saturday, isn't it? July 2nd. Wow. Sorry for the late notice. It's late to's fault. So, uh, hey, I'll put these out on the uh, information table, guys, if you're uh, interested and available. New Hope, Oahu, Sand Island. So these will be out there for you. Okay. I wanna, I'm so excited to show you some of the progress. You can already see with this first picture, yeah? Oh, you, you changed them. Sorry. Okay. All right, let's see here. Let me get my... All right, you're looking at the kitchen here. Uh, this is the opening, uh, the entrance to the kitchen. And this part here is the pantry. Uh, this here is going to be where the counter is going to be. It's actually going to be extended into this area here. You know how we put all the food on the tables in the kitchen now, inside the kitchen? Well, now instead of that, it's going to be a nice deep counter throughout the uh, length of the kitchen for the food. This is very important. Food is very important. So we want to make sure we get that uh, counter in there. Okay, now you're looking at the cry room. Uh, this again is where people go to cry when the sermon is really long. So that's the cry room. Uh, this is the entrance here. You're in the back of the sanctuary. Uh, the stage would be, oops, push that too soon. Uh, here, now you're looking at, by the way, I wanted to ask, Gail, what do you think of your office? Pretty cool, huh? See that window up there? She's going to keep her eyes on everybody because she's got a window in her office into the sanctuary. So um, she's going to know everything that's going on. And uh, this, again, is the uh, cry room. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's really, um, it's bigger than what we have here and this will be a glass uh, window here so that the nursing moms can um, cry in there with their, <laughs> with their babies and uh, nurse. And then again, here's the entrance. This actually opens up into the overflow area, and this up here is where Gail's office is. Uh, here you're looking at the, uh, we have only two entrances uh, to the sanctuary. This one here, this is to the front of the building and then this one here goes into the overflow and again just to give you an idea where you're at this is the cry room and that is the sound booth and I'll show you another uh, picture of that here in a moment and I, I want to come back to the ceiling uh, in just a moment here so this is now on the second floor and not only is the drywall being put up but it's being prepped and we're getting it ready to paint so uh, this is on the second floor this is a view of the uh, children's ministry classrooms and they all have windows and there are three large children's ministry classrooms and uh, they're on the second floor they actually have the best view in the house because that is their view <laughs> looking out those are all brand new windows this is the hallway uh, you're looking towards uh, Kaneohe and these are the steps coming up uh, if I were to show you before pictures this actually didn't even exist there was a wall that cut 
through here and that window right there at the top of the staircase wasn't there and we expanded it and straightened it out and acquired more of the uh, more square footage there and also more room for this classroom on the end there but there's again three of the children's ministry classrooms the drywall is being uh, prepped the windows are in and uh, so next thing we're going to do is the ceiling and then the flooring and for the most part we could uh, theoretically uh, have class uh, classes in there <laughs> so here's the inside of one of the children's ministry rooms and uh, this is looking towards the exterior uh, exit on the second floor to the exterior sta staircase this is the canal this is the north shore side of the property uh, this is now back downstairs you're looking at just to give you an idea where we're at here this is the sound booth back side of the sound booth this is the main entrance in the front the kitchen's back here uh, this window wasn't there we cut that out and put that window in this is the stairs going upstairs and this would be if you were standing in the overflow area uh, looking towards the front entrance and uh, the towards the kitchen now this is the opposite direction so there's the overflow area there there's the door to the sound booth there's the entrance into the sanctuary this right here where the boards are is the opening for the glass system where the main front entrance is going to be this is now inside the sanctuary uh, I'll come back to the, the ceiling again but I want you to uh, notice the uh, the ceiling here Frank and Kevin and Nick did a fabulous job on that but this is the stage the stage is going to be right here it's going to be a, a good sizable stage you can kind of see the uh, outline of it here it's going to come out all the way here that's the backstage door that I will be exiting out of after a bad sermon I'll be running out of that door but uh, and then this goes to the back of the property and then this goes back and then you're the fellowship halls here restrooms are on the other side of this wall and again you're on the you're, you're standing in front of where the cry room is looking at the front stage from this view this is a little bit closer up again there's the uh, backstage door uh, this is the restroom side here, the stage here, and let's, uh, I want to talk about this ceiling. All of those wood slats uh, were put in. Thank you, Frank. Nice job. <laughs> we decided to go with that instead of a black material uh, covering it. So that is what our, that's the finished look of the ceiling. It will be, though, painted black all of the ceiling will be uh, black and that will cover up a lot of the uh, foam and the conduit and the HVAC uh, duct work and so forth so now here is inside the sound booth that is a good sized sound booth if I stay out of it it should be just fine uh, for those guys and uh, this again is looking uh, towards the kitchen this is the entrance into the kitchen the opening uh, inside the kitchen and because the food will be on the outside there's gonna be a lot more uh, space on the inside of the kitchen this is upstairs you were asking where my office was gonna be I'm not actually gonna have a a full-on office my office is gonna double up as a conference room and a library and this is where it will be on the second floor again this is the window at the top of the stairs and this is the window that is in the conference room and uh, Gail's office is just adjacent uh, to that this is the window in Gail's office looking down into the sanctuary and then we move to the outside uh, this is the front entrance now I want you to pay particular attention to this uh, this is a, a two-tone uh, concrete that was poured this is the uh, accent on the outside and you can see the planters here uh, this is a ramp here for an entrance and there's a ramp here for an entrance and that is where the outdoor seating area is going to be and then the entrance into what will be close to the fellowship hall and the kitchen area now this is what it looks like with the concrete port and there's the nice two-tone effect 
Uh, we completely tore out all of the uh, exterior. There was a bus up curb here. And uh, so we put in the planters. And again, there's a ramp, no steps, uh, only a ramp, two ramps actually. And then also on this side is where the handicap or the uh, uh, disabled parking is going to be on this side. And then here's another view looking out towards the highway. You can see the ramp here. These planters will have, you'll actually be able to sit on the edges of them. You know, like at Ala Moana, where they're actually the planters and they have the ponds. The, I don't think we're going to do fish. Anybody want to maintain the fit? No. No need, right? Okay. So we'll just make planters, not ponds. Okay, good. Um, so you can actually sit on those uh, planters. It would be a, actually a seating area. And last but not least, I want to show you the absolute most beautiful mailbox I have ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> we fly, I have history with mailboxes. I, I don't want to necessarily go into all of it, but when we moved the office into the Agape shop, there was no mail service, and it took me six months. This is before uh, I hired Gail as my assistant, but it took me six months to get a mailbox and have it installed. And Frank custom designed it. Well, he kind of had to because it came in. Even after all of that, it was still wrong. And so he built this custom box for it and mounted it to the side of the building. And so, and then you got to bring the, the, the postmaster has to come out. He has to inspect it. He has to, you know, calibrate the keys. He has to authorize it, certify it. You know, he has to call OSHA, FEMA, the CIA, the NSA, everybody else. And then finally, he has to take and register it in what they call, I think it's the Red Book or something like that. Where's Tammy? She's not here tonight, right? She wouldn't know. I think it's a Red Book where they actually have to register the address. And we had to put it to where it was safe for the uh, mail delivery. So when they get out of the mail truck, they, they don't have to, you know, trek through hazardous, you know, ground. And so we got a beautiful concrete, you know, slab there for them. And we custom mounted it inside the fence so that Gail can get the mail on the on the inside of the fence and they can put the mail in on the outside of the fence. I want you to know a lot of thought went through this and that's why it is the most beautiful mailbox I've ever seen in my life. Okay? All right. Can I get an amen? All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so again, by the grace of God, we're making a lot of progress and it's really coming together and it's really, really exciting. However, uh, like I mentioned, we do covet your prayers. Uh, please pray, and if the Lord puts it on your heart, please give financially so that we can get this building done. I, I cannot even begin to tell you how excited I am to have our first service in our new building. I was uh, in Kailua today. We had to get a repair on my son's truck, and boy, I tell you, word is getting out. And so uh, Clyde at Clyde's Auto Repair was telling me, he said, man, I was, you know, by your church. Like, that is really nice. I'm like, I know, it's really nice. He said, when are you going to get in? I said, I hope it's October, maybe November, hopefully December. So, okay, January. No, this. <laughs> anyway, please pray. We cover your prayers and thank you so very much. All right, let's get into the word. We are going to complete the book of 2 Kings tonight. It might take us uh, about three hours, but no, it won't take us three hours. Well, actually, it may not take us uh, very long at all. Two chapters tonight, chapters 24 and 25, and we'll bring the book to an end. Next week, I'm going to have Ray fill in for me. I just sprung that on him tonight. Uh, he just found out that he was filling in for me next week, tonight. So I think it's something about being ready in and out of season, right? <laughs> Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be broken, something like that. So, but, uh, Lord willing, on the following Thursday, we'll start in First Chronicles. And I think that's going to be July the 14th, if my math is right. So, let's pray. We'll ask God to bless our time in his word. Loving Heavenly Father... 
We're so thankful to you for all that you're doing. Lord, you are so good. You have blessed us just exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond anything we could have ever thought or imagined or even asked. Lord, you have blessed us with a beautiful property and a beautiful building, and we're seeing it now come together, and we're just looking to you to provide all that we need to be able to finish it, complete it, and occupy it. Lord, we know that you're faithful and that you will do this, so we ask you for that. Lord, tonight as we bring this book of 2 Kings to an end, I pray that you'll bless our time together in your word and speak into our lives, Lord, as we give you our undivided attention, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Excuse me one. That way I don't have to yell. All right, let's jump in. Verse 1. Let's just start with verse 1 for now. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. I want to start off chapter 24 with a couple of things to point out, the first of which is that what Nebuchadnezzar does here is nothing shy of strategic brilliance in terms of his conquering of the nations surrounding Babylon. This is the beginning of the Babylonian captivity, as we're going to see. And he conquers these nations, these surrounding nations, by way of Egypt and Assyria, and in that as well, Judah and all of Israel. And he starts out by making Jehoiakim his subject. He subjects him, the king of Israel, to the king of Babylon. And what's really sad is that this will begin the captivity under the Babylonian Empire. And here's the thing. This is when Daniel and his fellow Hebrews that would eventually be named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is when they are taken captive into Babylon. It happens at this time in Israel's history. There's actually going to be three invasions. This is the first of three invasions, and it happened in the year 605 B.C., and then it led to the other two that took place in the year 597 B.C., and then later in 586 B.C. What's interesting is where we're told in verse 1 that Jehoiakim rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar after he had become a vassal. Now, when you see a detail like that, you always want to ask yourself, why do we need to know that? There's a reason why that detail is there. And one of the reasons it's there is because Nebuchadnezzar had to return to Babylon in order to secure succession to the throne. And I guess you might say to his credit, Jehoiakim takes advantage of it and seizes the opportunity to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. One commentator explained it this way, This campaign of Nebuchadnezzar was interrupted suddenly when he heard of his father's death and raced back to Babylon to secure his succession to the throne. He traveled about 500 miles in two weeks, which is remarkable speed for travel in that day. Nebuchadnezzar only had the time to take a few choice captives, which is why his choice of captives was the likes of Daniel. And also, as we're going to see, a few treasures and a promise of submission from Jehoiakim. And when Nebuchadnezzar had to make a hurried return to Babylon, Jehoiakim took advantage of his absence and rebelled against him. And what we're going to see as we get into this chapter is that that's going to come back into play here shortly. Verse 2, And the Lord sent against him raiding bands of Chaldeans, bands of Syrians, 
bands of Moabites and bands of the people of Ammon. He sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by his servants, the prophets. Keep in mind that this was prophesied, that this would happen because of Israel's disobedience and rebellion and idolatry in, in their rebellion against God that Babylon would take them captive and God would allow it. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Verse 3, Surely at the commandment of the Lord this came upon Judah to remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh according to all that he had done and also because of the innocent blood that he had shed for he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood which the Lord would not pardon. I think for those of you who have been a part of our study through the Old Testament uh, all of these years on Thursday nights, one of the things that has become abundantly clear is that God takes the shedding of innocent blood very seriously. I think of the Proverbs. I want to say it's Proverbs 6. I think it's Proverbs 6. The seven thing, the six things the Lord hates. The seventh, seven is an abomination to him. And one of the things that the Lord hates is the shedding of innocent blood. The shedding of innocent blood. Oh, this is a sobering portion of Scripture when it comes to this nation, this in this day in which we live. The reason why God allows Babylon to take them captive is because of the shedding of innocent blood. And how graphic is this? That we're told that Manasseh had filled Jerusalem with the shedding of innocent blood. And the Lord, it's not so much that he would not pardon it, the Lord cannot pardon it. The Lord cannot pardon it. Well, here we have the reason as to why it is that God would allow Judah to enter into this period of captivity by, by the Babylonians. And I think the lesson to be learned from this is that oftentimes God will allow us to be given over to our sin, our willful disobedience. He'll allow us to be taken captive into bondage, into the sin that we refuse to repent of. You know, Genesis 6 says that the Spirit of God does not strive with man forever. There does come a point where God says, okay, okay, fine. Romans 1 is one of the most terrifying chapters in all of the Bible because it says that God will give people over to their sin, especially when it comes to the sin of homosexuality, the sin of lesbianism, and God just says, you know, I'm not going to force my will upon you. I'm not going to force you to obey me. And, and I'm just going to give you over to this lust, this burning that you have. It's almost as if their mind is made up and their heart is hardened. And sadly, in some cases, their fate is already sealed. And, and God will never force himself on anybody. And there does come a point where God says, that's it. That's it. The only way that I can allow this to happen is because of your stiff-necked obstinance and your unwillingness to repent. Verse 5. Now, the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the king of Judah? And again, when we get to Chronicles, we're going to see a lot of details that are going to be filled in on all of these kings, especially the ones that we looked at last week, the nine good kings. We have a lot more detail in the Chronicles. So verse 6, Jehoiakim rested with his fathers. Then Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his place. And verse 7, the king of Egypt did not come out of his land anymore, for the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt, from the brook of Egypt to the river Euphrates. Jehoiakim was 18 years old. Now, just a little side note, parenthetically, when we get to the Chronicles, it's going to say that he was 8 years old. 
Uh, it's believed that this was just a copy error from the original translation. It is believed that he was likely 18 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem three months. <laughs> That's 90 days. His mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem. And here we go, verse 9. <laughs> he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father had done. Here again, we have yet another evil king of Israel with this Jehoiakim who was in effect so evil that his reign would only last for a total of three months. There is a verse in Ecclesiastes that talks about how the life of the evil are cut short because their life is so evil. And I suspect that's the case with this Jehoiakim doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Adam Clark had some insight into this. He says that he was a grievous offender against God. We learn from Jeremiah 22, which the reader may consult, and in the man's punishment see his crimes. Well, let's do that. Let's consult Jeremiah 22. It's verses 24 through 30. I'll read them. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, even if you, Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were a signet ring on my right hand, I would still pull you off. I will deliver you into the hands of those who want to kill you, those, who, those you fear, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and the Babylonians, I will hurl you and the mother who gave you birth into another country where neither of you was born, and there you both will die. You will never come back to the land you long to return to. In this man, Jehoiakim, a despised, broken pot, look at this imagery, an object no one wants, <laughs> Why will he and his children be hurled out, cast into a land they do not know? O oh, land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Record this man as if childless, a man who will not prosper in his lifetime, for none of his offspring will prosper. None will sit on the throne of David or rule anymore in Judah. Wow. <laughs> wow. Verse 10, at that time the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, verse 11, king of Babylon, came against the city as his servants were besieging it. Then Jehoiakim, king of Judah, his mother, his servants, his princes, and his officers went out to the king of Babylon, and the king of Babylon, in the eighth year of his reign, took him prisoner exactly according to the word of the Lord. And verse 13, he carried out from there all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house, and he cut in pieces all the articles of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord as the Lord had said. Ouch! Remember that? Remember all that gold? Didn't we try to figure out the value of all that gold in today's measure, and only to have it be taken now and carried away by the king of Babylon. In verse 14 also, he carried into captivity all Jerusalem, all the captains, and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives, and all the craftsmen and smiths, again, notice the detail, none remained except the poorest people of the land. Think about that. And he carried Jehoiakim captive to Babylon, the king's mother, the king's wives, his officers, and the mighty of the land he carried into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. 
Verse 16, all the valiant men, 7,000, and craftsmen and smiths, 1,000, all who were strong and fit for war. These the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. Then, verse 17, the king of Babylon made Mataniah, Jehoiakim's uncle, king in his place and changed his name to Zedekiah. In other words, I'm taking your king captive, so I got to appoint somebody else, so let's just have uncle do it. <laughs> verse 18, Zedekiah was not much older, 21 years old. That's a pretty young uncle when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamatal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. He also, verse 19, no surprise. Are we surprised? Did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that Joachim had done? For because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah, that he finally cast them out from his presence. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. Okay, a couple things here real quick as we finish the chapter. It's important to note that the fall of Jerusalem came in stages and that the Babyl Babylonian captivity started when Nebuchadnezzar took only the choice people, the skilled people. I'm going somewhere with this. I know you see it on the screen, but I mention this because this is the strategy of the enemy. I think of what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Don't be ignorant of Satan's devices. Satan is very cunning. He is very clever. He is very intelligent. I think of the imagery that Paul uses comparing Satan to a roaring lion, ro roaring and stalking his prey for an optimum time to attack. And interesting, Satan doesn't waste his time with those who pose no threat to him. I've always said that I don't worry when the enemy attacks me. I know that when the enemy attacks me, when the spiritual warfare is intense, and sometimes the spiritual warfare can be so very intense, I know it's intense because I pose a threat to the kingdom of darkness. When I begin to get concerned is when the enemy leaves me alone. And there's no spiritual warfare. I'm not being attacked. What I'm learning about the crafty cunning of the enemy is that these are the ones he usually tries to pick off first. These are the ones that he tries to take out first. He takes out the Daniels of this world. He takes out those who possess a certain skill set. He takes those who are leaders, who are gifted, who are talented, those are the ones that he targets. Those are the ones that have the targets on their back. Uh, let me give you an example. You know Ezekiel? You know the book Ezekiel? The prophet Ezekiel? The, the, the book that I quote all the time, uh, specifically chapter 38 in Ezekiel's prophecy concerning this upcoming yet future Russian-Iranian led alliance of nations that attack Israel? Well, the prophet Ezekiel was one that was taken captive on this first go-around. The likes of an Ezekiel. What's my point? My point is, is that Satan targets the Ezekiels. Satan targets the Daniels. Satan targets those whom God is using mightily because they pose a threat to the kingdom of darkness. Well, let's jump into chapter 25. We'll finish the book. Now it came to pass, verse 1, 2 Kings 25, in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it, and they built a siege wall against it all around. 
So the city, verse 2, was besieged until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. I, you'll forgive me for pointing out the graphic detail of how utterly horrific this was, but in the book of Lamentations we're told that the women because of this famine, would actually boil and eat their own children. That's how bad it got during this particular famine, if you can even just imagine. And this again was prophesied that this would happen. This is how utterly unthinkable and unspeakable it was during this time. Then, verse 4 the city wall was broken through, and all the men of war fled at night by way of the gate between two walls, which was by the king's garden, even though the Chaldeans were still encamped all around against the city. And the king went by way of the plain. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king, and they overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his armies were scattered from him. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and they pronounced judgment on him. Then, how sad is this? They killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. And then, how, how evil is this? Put out the eyes of Zedekiah after they let him see him, his, his sons killed first. And they put his eyes out and they bound him with bronze fetters and took him to Babylon. And verse 8, in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which was the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord <laughs> and the king's house. All the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great, he burned with fire. Did you catch that? He burned the temple, man. He destroyed the temple and all the houses. Why is God allowing this to happen? We're going to see in a moment. And verse 10, And all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls of Jerusalem all around. That's the question, isn't it? I mean, why would God allow the temple to be destroyed? This is the temple that God had Solomon build as splendid and spectacular and grand and glorious as it was. And now God is allowing it to be destroyed. Think this through with me. I, I'm going to surmise something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an assumption and, and really draw a conclusion as to why it is that I believe that God would allow this to happen. I believe that God would rather have the temple destroyed than to allow his people to continue to do what they were doing in the temple. Now think about that. As unimaginable as it would be to see this glorious temple destroyed and to imagine that God would allow it, that seems to me to be an indication that God would rather see the temple destroyed than to see his people defiling his temple the way they were. Now, that's pretty profound to me. Now, think about, transpose that into our own personal lives. Does that mean that God would rather allow that area in our lives? Who, who's the temple? It's not what's the temple, who's the temple? We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. What is happening in the temple? 
Think about that. I, that's kind of hard to wrap your mind around, I realize. But I think we would do well to consider how it is that God would come to the place where he would rather see the temple destroyed than to allow his people to continue in just unspeakable sin. The things they were doing inside the temple, it was unspeakable. They were sacrificing their children to the god Molech, passing their children through the fire, as we read last week. There were pornographic images inside the temple. There were idols, pornographic idols inside the temple. And then finally, God just says, that's it. I, I, I cannot take it anymore. I've had it. I would rather you be taken into captivity. That'll get your attention. At least I would like to think it will. And I would rather to have this temple completely destroyed than to allow this to continue even one more day. Even one more day. Verse 11, Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive the rest of the people who remained in the city and the defectors who had deserted to the king of Babylon with the rest of the multitude. But the captain of the guard left some of the poor of the land as vine dressers and farmers, the bronze pillars that were in the house of the Lord, and the carts and the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord. The Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried their bronze to Babylon. For those of you who are with us through our study of the details of the construction of the temple, this, this is painful. This is painful. When you think about all the work that went into the building of this beautiful temple. They also, verse 14, took away the pots, the shovels, the trimmers, the spoons, and all the bronze utensils with which the priests ministered, the fire pans and the basins, the things of solid gold <laughs> and solid silver. The captain of the guard took away the two pillars, one sea and the carts which Solomon had made for the house of the Lord. The bronze of all these articles was beyond measure. Just stop there before you go on to verse 17 and think through something else with me, just for a moment. Just indulge me. What do you think's going through the minds of the Israelites as they're witnessing this happen? They're, they're watching their temple be destroyed and broken into pieces and taken away. That's their temple. That was the temple they built. That was the temple they worshipped in. I can't even imagine what's going through their minds as they're watching this happen. And it gets worse. Verse 17, the height of one pillar was 18 cubits, and the capital on it was of bronze. The height of the capital was three cubits, and the network and the pomegranates all around the capital were all bronze. I, I remember some of these details when we were studying the construction of the temple. Just the ornate design with these pomegranates on those pillars, the capitals. The second pillar was the same with the network. And verse 18, the captain of the guard took Sedaiah, the chief priest, Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three doorkeepers. He also took out of the city an officer who had charge of the men of war, five men of the king's close associates who were found in the city, the chief recruiting officer of the army who mustered the people of the land and 60 men of the people of the land who were found in the city. So, verse 20, Nebu Zaradan, captain of the guard, took these and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. By the way, I, I hope you know where this is. This is in modern-day Iraq, about 50 miles south of the capital of Baghdad, the modern-day uh, capital of Iraq. Babylon is in modern-day Iraq. This is where this took place. And Babylon was known as one of the seven wonders of the world for the hanging gardens there in this, I mean, magnificent city. It was just magnificent. Then, verse 21, the king of Babylon struck them and put them to death at Riblah in the land of of Hamath. Thus Judah was carried away captive from its own land. Then 
You'll forgive me, by the way, for rushing through this horrible, horrible chapter. <laughs> Verse 22, Then he made Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, governor over the people who remained in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had left. Now when all the captains of the armies, they and their men, heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah governor, they came to Gedaliah at Mizpah, Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, J Johanan, the son of Kariah, Seraiah, the son of Tanhumeth, the, the Netophethite. <sighs> How am I doing? <laughs> and Jaazaniah, the son of Maachathite they and their men. And verse 24, Gedaliah took an oath before them and their men and said to them, do not be afraid of the servants of the Chaldeans. Are you kidding me? Have you seen what they've done? <laughs> Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon and it shall be well with you. But it happened in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishama of the royal family, came with ten men and struck and killed Gedaliah, the Jews, as well as the Chaldeans who were with him at Mizpah. And verse 26, all the people, small and great, and the captains of the armies arose and went to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. Now, verse 27, it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, released Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. What? He spoke kindly to him. What? And gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiakim changed from his prison garments, and he ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. And as for the, his provisions, there was a regular ration given him by the king, a portion for each day, all the days of his life. Inexplicable mercy shown to this evil king. Why? Don't know. God must have had some plan in having this happen, having him be on the receiving end of this. But needless to say, he has shown this mercy. What a way to end a chapter and a book, yeah? Well, there is a takeaway here, I think, for us tonight to take with us, and it's that of, and this is going to almost sound simplistic, but it's the importance of obedience, the paramount importance of obedience. Here's what I'm thinking. I can't quite wrap my mind around how all of this, as horrific as it was, didn't need to happen. Do you realize that this didn't have to happen? They could have actually stopped this from happening. Let me explain what I mean. This severe judgment of God on Israel could have been avoided if they would have but turned to God in repentance. You know, conspicuously absent from the narrative is any mention of anyone repenting before the Lord. There was no repentance. There was no repentance. It was only rebellion, and God had to judge it. I don't imagine God delighting in doing this. What we know to be true in scriptures that God does not delight in punishing the wicked, let alone doing this to his own. These are his people. He does not take delight in doing this. And so you have to ask yourself the question, why such graphic detail? Why did God deem it necessary to 
inspire the writer of the Kings and the Chronicles to record with such graphic detail all that happened to Israel. I believe it's to serve as a warning. It's to serve as a warning to us, especially when it comes to continually and willfully disobeying the warnings. How many times did God warn them? How many times did God try to apprise them of this? And yet they would not listen. They would shut their ears. I find it striking that throughout the pages of Old Testament scripture we read repeatedly where God says, Hear, O Israel, hear, O Israel. Why won't you hear? They wouldn't hear. And we would read as much. Did we not? God would declare, command, warn. And we would read their response. And they would not hear. They would not listen. Not only did they content, continually and willfully disobey the warnings from God, they just disobeyed God. And here's the thing. Had Israel but heeded God's warnings to them, we would be reading something entirely different than what we just read here tonight. All they would have had to do was confess and forsake. In order to be shown God's mercy, all they would have to do, very simple again, almost too simple maybe, confess and forsake. This is Proverbs 28, 13 and I'll end with this powerful proverb. I don't know how else to say it. This is a powerful proverb. He who covers his sins will not prosper. But, and I like this but, whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. You know, I find myself in my... Uh, prayer life many times just saying to God, God be merciful. It, it, one of my favorite sayings is just, oh God have mercy. I, I say it a lot when my son drives and I'm in the car and I'm teaching him how to drive, God have mercy. And But <laughs> what I'm really asking the Lord for is mercy, but what the Lord is requiring of me for said mercy is that I confess and forsake. What does forsake mean? Repent. What does repent mean? Do a 180 and about face. Turn your back on it. Change your direction. Go in the opposite direction. Forsake it. Confess it as sin. What does it mean to confess? I think sometimes we, just bear with me for a moment, because I was thinking about this this last week. What does it mean to confess? Well, surely it means to confess, to speak it, but confess also means to agree that this is sin. Now that might seem like a firm grasp of the obvious, but not so fast. Not so fast. To confess sin is to come in agreement with God that it is actually sin. See, and our problem is we don't want to call sin sin. We want to call it everything but sin sin. And so we, we've got to take the edge off of it. So all of a sudden now the sin of adultery is, is just an affair. It's just an affair. Oh, that's all. Just an affair. Just an affair. Oh, we're just living together. No, they call that fornication. I have yet to have a young couple come. I'm all I'm always talking about on the mainland. I'm ne this is not here, please. This is on the mainland. I never had a young couple come to me and say, hey, you know, we're just fornicating together. <laughs> because that's sin. But when you say, oh, we're, just, we're just living together. Oh, that's it? That's all? 
No worry. We don't want to call sin, sin. And here's the problem. 1 John 1, 9. It's been called the Christian bar of soap. If we confess our sins. That's it. All, all we have to do, confess our sins. As sin. Lord, I confess. This is sin. I confess it as sin. And I confess I have sinned this sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's a pretty good deal. It's the two-for-one deal, if I can call it that. We only do one thing, confess. And he does two things. He cleanses, he forgives, and cleanses. The forgiveness is instantaneous. The cleansing sometimes is a process, the process of sanctification, the process of purification. But he is faithful to forgive and to cleanse us of all our unrighteousness if we would but confess sin as sin. Confess that we have sinned this sin. And when we do, not only will we be on the receiving end of mercy, but God will forgive. One last thing. I was thinking about when Peter queried the Savior about how many times should I forgive my brother who sinned against me? Seven times? That's, that's, I'm sure Peter thought he was being very, very gracious. Wow, Peter. You're going to forgive him? Se wow, good for you. Good for you, Peter. Imagine his shock when Jesus' response was, no, not seven times, Peter, 70 times seven. Do the math. That's 490. I'm sure Peter figured that out. He was a fisherman. I'm sure he could do math, you know. And he figured, 490? Man, somebody's got to really have it out for you to sin against you 490 times and then to think that I've got to forgive them 490 times? Are you kidding me? Well, what am I saying? Well, if I'm to forgive someone else 490 times, how many times do you think God's going to forgive me? Maybe better ask, how many more times do you think God's going to forgive me? I think of it this way. You know when you've asked the Lord for forgiveness and you've confessed your sin and the enemy's right there to say, you're not going to ask for forgiveness for that again, are you? That you think he's going to forgive you again? Again? I hate that word, again? You think he's going to forgive you again? How many times? And, and the enemy's right there going, Don't, he's not, he's not going to forgive you, that's it. He's had it up to here with you. Remember when your parents used to say that? I have had it up to here with you. You never did? I did all the time. <laughs> I've had it up to here with you. That's it. And we sort of think that our Heavenly Father is the same way. He's not. He is quick to forgive. He will always, always forgive. The only thing that stands in the way of forgiveness from God is our confessing our sin to God. That's the only thing. And it's instantaneous. Why don't you all stand? We'll pray. This was a hard study tonight, Lord, and sad, really. Kind of heartbreaking to see all that happened to your people because of their idolatry, their sin, their disobedience, their rebellion. Lord, I pray that we would heed the warning from this in our own lives, that it may never be said of us that we were like this, lest we too be taken captive by our sin. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.